Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan features two radio professionals with over 100 years of broadcasting experience between them. Dave Hogan and Randy Houston are both native Western North Carolinians whose rich voices have been heard in every glade, cove, and holler of Western North Carolina and East Tennessee, primarily on AM radio. And between the two of them, they've worked in just about every radio format. As you can imagine, these guys have tons of stories about the day-to-day of live radio and the interactions they've had with listeners and entertainers while they were immersed in, at the time, one of the most influential and informative mediums available. Those experiences will be featured in this podcast series. Check the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts with Randy and Dave on Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. Welcome back, everyone, to Hot Mike with Houston and Hogan. I'm the Houston part of this deal. And this is Dave Hogan. Howdy from Hogan Holler. It's always good to be back with you, visiting with uh, you radio folks around Western North Carolina and East Tennessee. Dave and I get together on the radio and talk about uh, our careers in broadcasting uh, quite often. And you never know what will come up when we get together and start telling tales. And uh, one that we wanted to talk about a little bit today has an Asheville Roots has uh, a lot of roots in Asheville, North Carolina. And radio station WWNC, where you spent some time. Yep. You know, I saw a a letter to the answer man in the Asheville Citizen Times. Yeah. John Boyle. John Boyle. I read his column a lot. I do, too. I, I, it, I, I sent uh, John an email one day, and I said, you're holding things together over there at the Citizen Times. I don't know if we would take the paper if it weren't for your column. <laughs> well, that's... Uh, yeah, you know, there's... The newspaper business has been impacted by social media and the internet, just like our radio business that we talk about. Right. Uh, and they don't have near the staff that they used to have. And so much of the news print that you read is not local. And John is local. Yes, he is. And yes. somebody wrote a uh, question in the other day about the Jimmy Rogers historical marker in downtown Asheville and the fact that it's not there anymore. And uh, the answer was apparently a car jumped the curb and knocked it down. And they are in the process of replacing it. Maybe by the time our friends hear this, it'll be replaced. But on that historical marker for the father of country music, as he's often referred to, Jimmy Rogers, it says he started his career just a short distance from here at radio station WWNC. That's part of that marker? I didn't realize That's part of the marker. And uh, it's true. Now, he had... If I can use a Hogan Holler term, he piddled around in show business <laughs> before Jimmy Rogers came to Asheville, I believe, in 1927. And he, of course, was one of the first inductees. He and Hank Williams and Fred Rose were the first three inductees into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And uh, the Carter family, I think, was also inducted in that first class. But anyway, uh, Jimmy Rogers. Got his start in Asheville. So back in the 1960s, when I was on the radio for uh, on WSKY, and you got to keep in mind this is the probably the mid 1960s, and Jimmy Rogers was in Asheville in the mid 1920s. That's about 30 years. Yeah, 60 or 40 years. 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. So I got to thinking, maybe there's people listening who remembers Jimmy Rogers and perhaps met Jimmy Rogers when he was in Asheville. So I put out a call on the radio. Anybody who happens to be listening who remembers Jimmy Rogers, give me a call. Well, I had about six or eight, and I, I'll use the term old timers, but they were like in their 60s. You know, you go back 40 years, right? and they right. were in their 20s when Jimmy Rogers was in Asheville. So I gathered these fellows together in the studios at WSKY, 
and talk to them about their remembering Jimmy Rogers. I bet that was interesting. And I had a, a big spool of tape of these memories of Jimmy Rogers. Wow. Well, along about this time, Merle Haggard was really into Jimmy Rogers. And he had just recorded, I can't remember if he had just recorded or getting ready to record his uh, tribute album, a double uh, vinyl LP, two LPs of Jimmy Rogers' music. Same train, different time, I believe was the name of the project. And I knew that Merle was uh, heavy into Jimmy Rogers' music. So I had this tape of these six or eight fellows who remembered Jimmy Rogers. And shortly after I made this tape, uh, Merle Haggard came to town to do a show at oh. the city auditorium. Okay. And this was a period of time in Merle's life where he was uh, not giving interviews okay. to anybody. But I wanted to get that tape to Merle. So I went out and pecked on the bus door, you know. <laughs> and one of Merle's uh, people came to the door. And I introduced myself, and he almost slammed the door in my face. He said, uh, Merle's not doing interviews. You know, I introduced myself as Dave Hogan, WSKY Radio. And I said, well, Papa, I said, I don't want to talk to Merle Haggard. I don't want to interview Merle Haggard. But I've got some information about Jimmy Rogers, who used to live here in Asheville, that he might be interested in. There was talk of Merle doing a movie about Jimmy Rogers at the time. So the fellow said, okay, I'll ask him. So he went back, asked Merle if he would talk with me. And obviously Merle said yes, because the guy came back and said, come on in. <laughs> so I got on the bus there, and <clears throat> Merle welcomed me, very friendly. And uh, we sat down, and I told him about this project that I had, uh, uh, interviewing people who remembered Jimmy Rogers, and I had made – Merle a copy of the tape and That's I said fantastic. would you like a copy of oh yeah I'd love to have it wow so I gave this copy of the tape to Merle Haggard time goes on maybe three months and I get a call at the radio station it's late in the afternoon I was doing the afternoon shift at the time and it was Bonnie Owens and Merle was married to Bonnie at that time. She said, uh, we're, we're on a bus, Merle and me and the boys out in Arizona, New Mexico, somewhere out in the Southwest. And Merle's got a question for you. Oh. Do you remember anything? Can you tell us anything about Emmett Miller? Emmett Miller. Emmett Miller. And I thought a moment and I says, I've heard the name, but I really don't know anything about Emmett Miller. And what happened, one of the fellows I interviewed about remembering Jimmy Rogers brought up the name Emmett Miller, and I'd paid no attention to it. Right. But he said in that interview, he said, I remember Emmett Miller teaching Jimmy Rogers how to yodel. Really? How to yodel. And, of course, yodeling was one of the real uh, trademarks of Jimmy Rogers. Well, listen. Yodeling, yodeling. And so. That's called the blue yodel number nine. <laughs> blue right? yodel number nine. So uh, Merle was trying to find out who Emmett Miller was. I mean, here's a historical figure who taught the father of country music how to yodel. So Bonnie says, Merle wants to find out more about this man. Okay. And, and so another two or three or four months goes by, and I get a package in the mail from Merle Haggard. And it was an al album that he had found of Emmett Miller. Really? So... And he had some information in there. He said, we're trying to find out uh, 
Bonnie called you, and, and we want to find out who, who Emmett Miller is. Yeah. And so he has a little uh, biography of Emmett Miller. Well, it turns out Emmett Miller was a uh, minstrel show performer and did uh, a lot of, uh, of course, in those days, it was common, blackface you right, know, was right. common as part of the minstrel shows, sad to say. So Emmett Miller was the first person to record the Lovesick Blues. And the Lovesick Blues was on this album. And, of course, that was uh, Hank Williams' signature song. It's full of yodeling. And so uh, I started researching uh, Emmett Miller <clears throat> and later on had another opportunity to interview Merle Haggard after I moved to uh, Tennessee, came there for a show. And uh, once again, I uh, used Jimmy Rogers as an excuse to get on the bus and talk to Merle. <laughs> so we had a long talk, and he told me about uh, the research he'd done to uh, find out more about uh, Emmett Miller. Now listen to this. Emmett Miller had a band called the Georgia Crackers. Emmett Miller was from Macon, Georgia. You remember Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey? Oh, you know, of we played uh, Tommy Dorsey on WISE Wise. We sure did. In the 1990s when we were playing uh what we call it the Stardust Stand format Stardust. or something yeah, like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. Playing uh, great American music. Right. Emmett Miller's band included Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey and Gene Krupa one of the great jazz yes, drummers. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, one of the, you know, Johnny Carson liked to play drums. Right. And he often mentioned Gene Krupa as his big influence. And a great jazz guitarist known as Eddie Lang. So that was Emmett Miller's band, the Georgia Crackers, Jimmy and Tommy Dorsey, Gene Krupa, and Eddie Lang. What a band. Man, what a band. Earl was in Macon, Georgia, the hometown of Emmett Miller doing a show and seems to me like he said he was got in the hospital maybe had some laryngitis or some kind of medical situation while he was in Macon so he wound up spending a few days there and since that was Emmett Miller's hometown he started inquiring about Emmett Miller there in Macon and he found out Emmett was buried in a cemetery there in Macon, Georgia. Now, believe it or not, Emmett Miller, who did blackface in the minstrel show, was married to a black woman. Wow. To show you how complicated and complex society can be, a blackface performer married to a black woman. And of course, Emmett was white. And because he either was or had been married to a black woman, they would not bury him in the white section of the cemetery there in Macon. So Emmett Miller was buried over in the black section of the cemetery in Macon. Merle also found out that there was no marker on his grave. So Merle put up the money to put a marker on Emmett Miller's grave in Macon, Georgia. What a story. That's amazing, Dave. I had no clue. So I have a great respect for Merle Haggard, even though he had a reputation of being a little hard to get along with and standoffish, to use that Hogan Holler term. And, but because of my experiences with Merle, through Jimmy Rogers, and you played a little bit of the Blue Yodel, and there's a good story about that. It's one of the great pieces of American music. And here's why. The Jimmy Rogers Blue Yodel Number 9. On that recording is Louis Armstrong playing the trumpet and his wife, Lil, I believe, playing the guitar, uh, playing the piano. 
Lil. So, yes, that's right. <clears throat> so Jimmy Rogers, country. Louis Armstrong, jazz. Yeah, deep, heart of jazz. And Lil, I believe her last name was Lil Harden. Harden Armstrong. Playing the blues. So you had country, mm-hmm. you had jazz, and you had the blues on that one recording there. And a lot of people don't realize that Jimmy Rogers recorded with Louis Armstrong. A lot of people, including myself, don't, didn't realize how uh, how complex Jimmy Rogers and his taste of music and his love of music was. <laughs> I mean, this guy, uh, he was cutting edge. He was at uh, WWNC, as I mentioned, in 1927. And shortly thereafter, I'm not sure of the exact year, uh, Ralph Peer came to Bristol, Tennessee to record some Appalachian music. Jimmy Rogers heard about this recording opportunity, so he took his band, went over to Bristol, where, the, where, the, where they now have a, um, a Hall of Fame dedicated to what's called the Big Bang of country music. Yeah, where Jimmy Rogers, the Carter family, and several others were recorded at the same time, uh, or during the same few days. But Jimmy Rogers took his band over there, and the band had a arg- big argument, big argument, and the band <laughs> broke up. So Jimmy was there without a band. No band. No band. The the, the band, Jimmy Rogers' band, they all came back to Asheville. <laughs> And left him over there, and I'm sure they regretted that later on because he seemed like he picked up guitar players to accompany him as well. He played the guitar, too. And they recorded uh, two or three tunes for Ralph Peer. And Was Ralph Peer and this recording project you're talking about chronicled in the movie uh, Songcatcher? Mm, I'm not sure. I remember okay. seeing Song Catcher, but I don't, don't think it was Raph Peer. It was uh, Alan Lomax, I believe. In, okay, in Song okay. Catcher. But Raph Peer was with RCA, what became RCA Records. Okay, okay. Yeah. And thus uh, the association of the Carter family with RCA. For yeah, C- yeah, yeah. And Camden. Camden was uh, uh, named after Camden, New Jersey, which was a subsidiary of RCA. So those Jimmy Rogers recordings became hits, and his career was off and running. He came to Asheville, had tuberculosis. You know, That's why he wound up here to begin with, right? At one time, Asheville was considered uh, a place to go. Healing. Breathe that pure mountain air. As it turned out, because of the, the humidity, for one thing, it was not a good place for people with tuberculosis you know a lot of the old houses and i one time owned one on edwin place in Asheville, had sleeping porches what they call sleeping porches for those people who had uh, problems with breathing and so forth sleep out on the porch wow but anyway that's that's how jimmy rogers wound up in Asheville, and uh, he along with the carter family and Maybe the Stonemans, I'm not 100% sure of that, recorded uh, in Bristol, and those recordings became very popular, and they call it the Big Bang of country music, and therefore Jimmy, as well as being known as the singing brakeman, became known as the father of country music. Dave, uh, maybe you can tell me this. Maybe I I should know it, but you you mentioned uh, Jimmy Rogers was a... uh, a guest many times on 570 WWNC, and that was the time that those studios were state-of-the-art and located in the Citizen Times building. He had a show. He had a show. Yeah, he, okay. You know, days of live radio. <clears throat> well, that was my question. Yeah. Where, was he on the Farm and Home Hour? No. Prob- had, had I'm not his, sure. Had his own show. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, on the Farm and Home Hour, they used live music. Right, right, right. But I th- think and i stand corrected i think jimmy rogers had an early morning show okay you know he worked not only as a musician in Asheville, but he worked as a detective for the railroad 
Okay, where, is that how the moniker, uh, the singing brakeman, came in? Right. He was working for the railroad. I think his dad worked for the railroad, and uh, he grew up around trains. And one of his hits was the Mule Skinner Blues, Hey, Little Water Boy. <laughs> and he was a water boy. He was actually, Jimmy Rogers is actually a water boy for the trains. Wow. Well, the uh, historical marker that started all this conversation is, uh, like you said, scheduled to be placed back on Walnut Street downtown. Mm. No, what's the street in front uh, of the Civic Center? Battery Park. Battery Park. Battery Park. Yeah. Avenue. Yeah. yeah. And right in front of where the old Woolworth, uh, okay, drugstore or Woolworth department store was located. We all understand that. I used to work in sales at the radio station, and every town I'd go into had this old character and tell me, you know, well, let's go down there and see uh, uh, the Woolworth store and see if we can sell them some advertising. Well, where's it at? It's right down there, past where the old store used to be that burnt down, and uh, yeah, you, you know. <laughs> In front of the old Woolworths, yeah. we know where that is. And if you're going to drive out in the country and uh, hunt up where you turn off to go to Hogan Holler, you go right past where that feller's barn burned down about 10 years ago. <laughs> That's it. That's you it. You go right past that place and turn right. Turn right. Take a next road to the right. <laughs> yeah. When we come back uh, on maybe our next podcast, yeah, let's talk a little more about Merle Haggard and some of his, you know, he was <clears throat> to be somebody who, did not have an advanced education. He was, like Hank Williams, a great lyricist, a great writer. Absolutely. And it came as a natural talent to him. Like mm-hmm. you said, he uh, <clears throat> was not, uh, uh, did not come from a privileged background, a uh, 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 dysfunctional background, if you will, wound up in trouble with the law. And, uh, and that talent, uh, I saw Red Skelton on Johnny carson rerun uh replay of the johnny carson show and he had red skelton on and red skelton gave uh johnny carson the compliment uh because johnny had a three minute show on local la tv every morning and in three minutes he became johnny carson and red skelton says i don't care if you give him three minutes one minute or put him behind a wall talent will survive talent will come forward and that's exactly what happened with Merle Haggard. Uh, I don't, and lots of other yeah, artists. Yeah. I mean, I don't care if you yeah. do put him in prison. He's going to sing songs and have mm-hmm. hits about prison songs. You know, he, he's he's that kind of great artist. My favorite Merle Haggard song is Carolyn. And why? It tells a story back to... Uh, Back to what they all say about country music. It's the story, man. It's the story. Carolyn tells the story of this man who's mistreated at home. And Carolyn, uh, every man that's mistreated at home will do that. You, you know, and, and it's such an incredible story and the power and the way he told a story Merle Haggard was uh, an uh, a writer, uh, an author. He he delivered in three minutes a book for you to follow along to in music. I got to tell one more Louis Armstrong story. Go ahead, man. Since you brought up uh, Johnny Carson, I saw Louis Armstrong on uh, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson way back when, years ago, and. Both uh, Louis Armstrong and Johnny Carson had multiple marriages. <laughs> and, you know, Johnny would often, in his unique way, refer to refer to <laughs> one or more, one or more of those marriages and how much it cost him. <laughs> yes. And I remember Louis Armstrong saying, well, when I divorced a woman, I just gave her everything. Johnny he said, that's the best thing to do. Just give her everything you've got. Because I'm not going through that court stuff. When I break up, when we, di- we divorce, I, everything except clothes on my back. But that's all I take. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> Four times, I believe. 
And anyway, he said, well, you know, I'll just go out and start over again. Of course, he had the ability to have one hit record and start over again. Yeah. Do a few club shows. Yeah. yeah. And he's back on his feet again. But I thought that was pretty clever. Because I'm not going through all that uh, court stuff and (laughs) arguing and everything. I just give him everything I've got. (laughs) You take it all and I'll start over. And again, that goes right back to a conversation you and I are having at lunch today about uh, the artistic side of people. Uh, usually, it goes along that the artist, the more artistic a person is, the less business-like they are. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, here's the musician just saying, "You know, you take everything. I'll start over again." <laughs> and, yeah. and not, uh, I don't have time to go to court. <laughs> I don't have time to argue about money or who owns what, or who's going to get what. You just take it all, get out of my life, you go your way, and I'll go mine. It's really not bad thinking, you know. It's really not bad thinking. Well, hey, buddy, we just love talking to you all about all of the topics, and you never know. We don't know where the stuff comes from. I know uh, once in a while we'll pop an email to the other. Hey, next time we get together, let's talk about this or that or the other. But most of the time, we just sit down, turn the mic on, start talking. That's called Hot Mic with Houston and Hogan. Uh, two old broadcasting buddies that uh, used to work together, and we've played every kind of music and every kind of format and done remotes at every kind of jip joint in the world. And uh, we, we're just full of stories. So, uh, And when we come back, let's talk some more about Merle Haggard. All right. Let's always talk more about Merle Haggard. Thank you for joining us on Hot Bike with Houston and Hogan. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Be sure to click the subscribe button for another episode of Hot Mike with Randy Houston and Dave Hogan.